Hello and welcome to the Good Society Forum. My name is Emma Skye and I'm director of Yale World Fellows and co-host of the Good Society Forum, which is a community of change makers around the world with a common quest to build the good society. My co-host is Nazama Dean of the Prince's Trust and a 2019 Yale World Fellow. Niz. Emma, thank you so much and hello everybody. Uh, and welcome to our Good Society Forum webinar today. Uh, by joining, that is the only criteria we have for membership. It's a very easy membership. You are now part of our global community. So thank you very much. We are also on social media, which we would love for you to follow us on. And not just that, but today, if, you, you know, if you've heard anything that was uh, particularly impactful, we would love for you to share. On Twitter, we are on at Goodstock Forum. We're also on LinkedIn. Uh, the Good Society Forum, as well as on Facebook. So please do make sure you follow us. And moving forward, if you have any ideas for sessions, if you wish to be a panelist, which we have, you know, last week we had Mutarza Sheikh who reached out to us and, and joined our panel on hate speech, please do let us know. You can email us or at info at goodsocietyforum.com. So as always, what we like to do is just to get a small flavor of where everybody is from. So if you are tuning in already, uh, please type in in the chat function, what city are you currently in? Um, and maybe what's, what's the weather like where you are today? Because it's really lovely in London. Um, so we have Azim from um, Bishek in Kyrgyzstan. Azim, thank you so much for joining. You're a regular, we love seeing you all the time. I think people are feeling shy today on the chat function. Please don't feel shy. Please do let us know where you're from. Uh, we have Dr. Atim from Nigeria. Thank you for joining us. We have Norma uh, from Hamden. Hi, Norma. Lots of love. Uh, we, uh, we have oh, and a special hello to AR from Norma too. Uh, we have Dr. Ajami from Monrovia and Liberia. Thank you so much. Steve says it's a bit gray in Luton. Uh, thank you for joining us. Amy uh, from New York City. It's hot and humid. Valentina from Italy. Thank you. Um, Ibrahim, uh, it's cloudy skies in Liberia. Leila Vasquez from Mexico City. Uh, Jorge from uh, Guadalajara in Mexico. Uh, we are always amazed just how diverse our community is. Thank you so much for joining us. If you have questions throughout, you know the drill. Please do fill it in the chat function and we'll put it to our speakers. Uh, wow, Sydney. Yeah, Enoch from Sydney. Thank you so much. It's fine weather, I can imagine. Um, Emma, what are we talking about today? Well, the global pandemic has forced us to not only examine what makes a good society, but what makes a good life. The pandemic has made us conscious, as if we need any reminders, of how precarious life actually is. We have felt sickness and death all around. We have seen how people are impacted differently the gaps between privilege and poverty, wealth and marginalization. Some have found solace in faith. Some have been driven by their faith into activism for social justice. Faith leaders, religious institutions and activists, moved by their spirituality, have been at the forefront of confronting these inequalities and deep social fissures. People across the world have been turning inward and have been seeking spiritual, if not religious, community to help them through this time, to give this chaotic moment some sense of meaning. So today we look at the promise and pitfalls of spirituality in a time of pandemic. A faith, religion, spirituality, forces for good. How has ritual practice and the way we convene sacred community changed? What does it mean for the future of organized religion? Is a spiritual life more vital than ever? Incredibly important questions. And I am delighted to introduce our first speaker, uh, who I hope will be joining us on the screen shortly, is uh, dear friend Abdul Rahman Malik, an award-winning journalist, educator, and organizer. Abdul Rahman was appointed Associate Research Scholar and Lecturer in Islamic Studies at Yale Divinity School in June 2019 and is Program Coordinator at Yale University Council's, uh, University's Council on Middle East Studies 
and serves as director of the Muslim Leadership Lab, an innovative project being incubated at the Dwight Hall. I think we've lost Niz there. I think we, I think we did, but it's, it's, it's good. Emma, should I, should I jump in? Well, I was going to finish the introduction. <laughs> I was going to say, you love coffee, and you love coffee so much that you made a documentary on it called The Mohammedan Bean. The history of Islam and coffee. And you're also a 2018 Yale World Fellow. So, Dr. Rahman, thank you very much for joining us. Emma, it's so good to see you and so good to see so many friends from around the world um, on this call. And I just want to thank you and, and Niz for, for this invitation and, and for, for um, inviting all of us into this space to, to shape what I think is a really important conversation. And so, I, 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 uh, because I'm in kind of pole position, I want to throw out a, a few thoughts, really, which I hope and I know uh, my colleagues, including my uh, old friend Rabbi Laura, were, are going to are going to pick up in the in the conversation. Um, uh, first of all, I, I want to say assalamu alaikum to to everyone, to all of our friends and those who are those who are tuning in. Um, for for me personally, uh, these last few months of being in lockdown and in this moment of pandemic have been have been challenging at times, have been liberating at times, but certainly have left me um, not a lot only to think about, but but a lot to consider in terms of issues of faith and spirituality. Um, how do we give our time and life meaning, but also how do we organize around these very important parts of ourselves, and in fact, very important parts of, 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 uh, of the human identity. Um, my lockdown pandemic period really started with the, the death of one of um, my dearest friends, um, a mentor, uh, a father figure in my life, an older brother. Uh, Fuad Nahdi was an incredible journalist, a writer, a thinker, polymath. Um, a mischievous Renaissance man. Um, and in many ways, I, I, I came to Yale because I, I knew I had the support and, and the mentorship of, 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 people like, of people like him throughout the last 25 years. And in thinking about today, I was drawn back to, I was drawn back to something that Fuad said to me very early in our friendship, way back in 1995. And we were discussing at that time, um, the emerging identity in the United Kingdom. And, and for those of you who are global, I hope this will make sense in just a moment, that, that you know, we were discussing the, um, the emerging identities of Islam and Muslimness. And in fact, as, as an example, as, as, as a case study of how religious identities emerge and how important those identities can be, not only in shaping personal and private life, not only shaping the internal spiritual space, but actually in terms of shaping the, uh, um, our engagement with the world. And, and he had asked a very important question. And, you know, 25 years later, that question sits with me. He asked, he says, you know, beyond beards, and I have a big one these days, a proper quarantine beard. He asked, beyond beards, scarves, and halal meat, what does it mean to be a British Muslim in the 21st century? And I remember when I first heard that question, I, I, I kind of laughed. It, it seemed a little bit glib. But the more I thought about it, the more it made sense to me. Part of faith and acting upon it, of course, is ritual practice. Part of it is the way in which we choose to express our faith identities. But more than that, faith and spirituality for me is about a way of being, being in the world and how not only do we find meaning in the world, but how do we create meaning in the world? How do we go out into the world to ameliorate the horrible conditions that we see? How do we go out in the world to rectify the injustices that we see around us? Is our faith merely something that we practice personally, personally excuse me, or within closed community? Or is it something that takes us out of ourselves and allows us not only to connect with others, but to do good in the world? 
And I learned so much from my Christian and, and Jewish friends about this, the whole idea of tikkun olam in the Jewish tradition about, about healing and repairing the world resonates with me deeply, just as the, um, the works of James Cohen and Cornel West and, and others resonates with me from the Black liberation theology tradition. What is all of this have to do with this moment that we're in. I think as we found ourselves in lockdown, I think that we've had to consider what it, me what <clears throat> what it means to be faithful for those of us who are faithful. And for people who have been looking for meaning, it has been spiritual and or religious spaces that have been the source of incredible community. I think often we think about religious <clears throat> excuse me, religious or spiritual life being uh, mediated through institutions. What I found particularly interesting at this time is how we have sought to almost um, DIY those kinds of spaces within the absence of the temple or the synagogue or the mosque or the church. To me, it's been interesting viewing things within Muslim communities, particularly in the United States, Canada, the United Kingdom, in, in, in Europe, and also beyond, is how we have created these new online spaces, these new conglomerations and configurations of spiritual space that somehow in this pandemic moment, people who didn't go to the mosque for years all of a sudden found themselves seeking a sense of spiritual community. And I've been seeing that anecdotally. I've been following that on Facebook, on Instagram, more than, more than likely, where these kinds of communities are being created, new formations of community. I think that speaks to the power of faith to provide the moral, um, ethical framework that is required to make sense of the world uh, that we're in now. And of course, I think that Th that this is also a question of power and it's also a question of privilege. I think the moment that we're in right now has caused a certain amount of power and privilege to be lost from religious institutions, has allowed for maybe not a more personalized approach, but for new formations of community. Not that they didn't exist before, but I think they are emboldened now because those new formations of community also understand spaces outside of physical structures and religious institutions. They understand that community can be created digitally. Uh, it's run by millennials and Gen Z for whom it is not merely um, uh, their, 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 their digital um, actions in the world are not merely that they're digital native, but they're hot wired for it. And so one of the things, as I conclude, that I'd like to consider is the ways in which faith has been organized and spiritual spaces have been organized to give meaning. How have those affected existing institution, churches, um, synagogues, and other institutions which have physical buildings or are actually institutionalized. And the last thing that I would like us to consider is ways in which faith and religious discourse and spirituality has been at times weaponized to support certain powers or certain, um, uh, certain political points of view. Um, and I'm thinking about, for example, certain right-wing evangelical movements in the United States. Um, and also alt-right movements and also white supremacy movements that link themselves to a kind of a religious rhetoric. How has faith been weaponized? But also how has faith been made and, and been a core part of the resistance to that, but also in this post-George Floyd moment of, of the Black Lives Matter uprising and the anti-racist movements, what role is faith and spirituality playing in terms of organizing dissent and change? And the last thing I'll say, Niz, is that, is that I think it's important for us, particularly those of us who are in the United States or in the West, to recognize that the very uh, civil rights and human rights movements of the 1960s that went into the 1970s, that those movements were based on organizing through parishes and churches. Black religion, Black churches were vital in terms of the process of organizing resistance and also organizing change-based 
uh, change-based movements. I think that's a, that history is important for us to keep in mind because it gives us a sense, a real example of the ways in which faith has operated in times of crisis. And I would definitely say that we are in a time of multiple crises right now. Uh, sorry, Niz, for, for taking an extra minute and a half. Uh, oh, back, back over to you. Thank you very much, Abdurrahman. And our next speaker is Rabbi Laura Jana Klausner, who is a senior rabbi in Reform Judaism. And she was born in London and brought up in an Orthodox synagogue before moving to the Reform Movement in her teens. And Laura moved to Jerusalem, where she lived for 14 years, working in education at the Institute for Youth Leaders from abroad and at Mellet's and as the director of the Center for Christian Encounters with Israel, where she helped train Palestinian tour guides in Jerusalem and Bethlehem. And she also facilitated dialogue between Israelis and Palestinians. Now, Laura is a familiar face and voice across British television and radio and holds three postgraduate degrees. So <laughs> Rabbi Laura, Shalom, thank you for being with us. I can unmute myself. Thank you for having me. And I uh, just wanted to say that Fuad was a very strong uh, loss. He really was, and too young. So I just wanted to echo that. Um, we've adapted, uh, we've added, but there is a lot that's missing. So across the board, both in religious, sort of the standard religious streams, um, and in more uh, un unstandard, that's not the word, non-institutionalized spiritual spaces, people have done an unbelievable job of adapting quickly. Um, people who didn't think that they were tech have managed to adapt religious spaces. Um, and it has brought with it some very fascinating questions. So one of the questions, if not my question, but a Christian question that I've been watching is about the status of the Eucharist. And maybe one of our Christian colleagues could talk about it. From the point of view of Jews, we have asked the question, what is virtual and what is real? So we need 10 people, and in Orthodoxy, 10 men, but in uh, progressive Judaism, women count too, um, to be part of a quorum for a prayer service, certain parts, key parts of the prayer service. So if I'm online with nine other people, does that count? Is it really a service or do we have to change it? Can we really say the prayer for the dead? If we are online, so we might feel that we are present, but there is a different element in being virtual. And as the word virtual says, it's not completely there, is it? So these are the questions that have uh, arisen within Jewish spaces for Orthodox Jews who do not use, actively use electricity on Shabbat, turning off and on and so on. They are not um, live streaming or Zooming whatever services. So what does that mean from the point of view of spirituality when Jews are built for, we cannot pray in many ways without communal prayer. We can do individual prayer and there is a space for it, but reading from the Torah, key moments cannot happen on our own. So we have been hit in our communality. Um, on the other hand, the progressive movements across the world are off the scale doing brilliantly. We've completely reinvented Judaism in a way that it hasn't been reinvented, I think, since the temple was destroyed in 70 CE, so quite a while ago. Um, and we've done a beautiful job of it and fascinating both for us and um, both for us and for uh, other religious spaces, we have data showing an increase in presence. Now, I wouldn't really call it participation because you don't know what's going on when someone is turned on their Zoom, but presence or what we would not in normal times call footfall, when someone actually rocks into a church or a synagogue or temple or whatever, or a mosque, um, footfall, which is now press the button fall, um, is increased. And we've seen that people, along with that, has been this thirst. 
a thirst for spiritual for its spirituality a thirst for community a thirst for involvement because of course when you cut something take something away we are robbed and i think many people have felt robbed of other people and there's been an enormous yearning and that has been both for other people so both horizontally for community but also vertically what is the meaning of this why is this happening i need solace i need care i need love so the spiritual aspect whether you find it in the monotheistic space or in a far more meditative space we have seen that that has increased and the data shows it um but what's missing the things that hold us the things that religion does so brilliantly of ritual of presence so we have been robbed doesn't even start to define the language when you cannot be with someone when they are in their terror when you cannot be with someone when they are in transition um, and when they are dying it has harmed our normal psychological healthy processes and however many ceremonies you do afterwards and however much memorial you do afterwards we have this has been stolen from us these vital moments that align with our psychological need and of course along with that goes funerals so we made in progressive movements a decision to have online funerals because we wanted to protect our, our mourners we wanted to protect our clergy and also our um cemetery staff and other groups haven't done that and it's been there have been some clergy deaths which have been terrible but what does it mean to be in a funeral when you're not in the funeral, you're watching it? Now, some of it's been very moving and in a way, no one's watching you. So you can retreat and just be present. But it's another layer of, uh, I'm sorry if this sounds a bit smutty, what has been called by a friend, mourning interruptus. We just have not done what we needed to do that is aligned to our rituals. So we've had things adapted We've had things added beautifully, but there's a lot that's been missing. You came on, I shut up. That was perfect, Laura. You, you, thank you so much. And I, and, I, and I know you had more to say there. That was um, incredibly insightful and, and very powerful. Um, our next speaker is Atam Bile Ma Sola. Hopefully the video is working. Um, who is, so we've gone from New Haven to London to now going to South Africa. Um, uh, Athambile is a writer, researcher, and teacher at the University of Pretoria. She has a PhD from the university currently known as Rhodes, I love that, focusing on black women's historiography, intellectual histories, and life writing. She's the founder of Asina Kutula, is that right? Brilliant. Collective, which is a group of teachers and researchers who aim to challenge the continued marginalization of women's narratives in the school curriculum, and is also one of the creators of the podcast Umoya on African spirituality. Atambile, we are so glad that you're here with us and can't wait to hear your perspective. Thanks, Nizam. Um, and um, thank you for this opportunity. Um, so in my language, when you greet people, um, I'm going to use the isizulu um, word to greet all of you, which is sanbonani which means I see you, even though it's a virtual room and um, I don't really see you, but it's a way of recognizing and sort of the, the being in me recognizes the being in you. And in another language we say, Gamaka. So thank you so much for um, this opportunity. And I think I'm gonna start off with some disclaimers because I'm coming from the position of African spirituality, which is not actually um, a religion. We're not an organized religion. And so I'm not here as a spokesperson of an organized religion. Um, and I'm going to try to speak to some of that. And so on the one hand, I'm, I'm, talk, I'm going to be talking about expressions of African spirituality. And largely the reason for that is because African spirituality is probably as misunderstood as um, the continent is, well, one is as vast as the continent. Um, so if you think I'm in Southern Africa and someone in Northern Africa or even East Africa or West Africa experiences it in very different ways, that's the first thing, it's as vast as the continent. And the second thing is that it is probably equally as misunderstood as the continent. Um, and so when I'm talking, I'm talking from a vantage point of my experience in Southern Africa, which is quite particular um, when we think about the violence of Christianity and the violence of Islamic influences on the continent. 
And so typically most people you will find on the continent integrate and I come from that school or that tradition that integrates African spirituality and Christianity. Um, and then of course you also get people who are in the binaries because of fear. So you will get the kind of evangelical ultra orthodox whatever religion on the one hand or completely on the other hand people who don't um, practice the recognized Abrahamic faiths largely in, in our context, context and, and go to the, to the other side of African spirituality. And perhaps it's also important to say South Africa is probably the best melting pot where we have every kind of expression in our country. So from a young age, I've been exposed to all kinds of religions without any of the kind of frictions and conflicts we've seen in other parts of the world. And so just to say, um, uh, I do come from the, the, the tradition to, that's integrated. And an example of that is that my great grandfather was a Baptist minister my mother had a calling to be a healer and rescinded that calling and went back into the church. And that's quite a typical example. And for people who are interested, um, sort of the popular narratives that are about this kind of experience can be found in books like Things Fall Apart, um, Chinua Achebe's novel, very famous novel, as well as Nervous Conditions by Titi Dangarimba, if you want to get a sense of some of the push and pull or the, the tensions in that kind of integration. Um, and so when I say um, I'm talking about African spirituality, I'm talking about it from the experience of Southern Africa. And in my context, I am Kosa, which many people know of Zulu people, but there are about many cultural groups. And I come from the Kosa expression of African spirituality. Um, and we, we do, while we do find resonances with other parts of people on the continent, um, I'll, and I'll give another example of scholars who've written about this, someone like Mali Dome Some, who comes from the Dagara tradition, and Sabon Fusome, who have quite been famous in that respect about writing about their um, vantage point of African spirituality. We find resonances with some of their ways of thinking about this. So I'm saying all these disclaimers to explain that I'm not a spokesperson, but also it's not a homogenous experience. And it's very, and, and, and I think, that's quite the experience with a lot of religions at this point, whether they're organized or more fluid, but that it, it, it captures the essence of that place and those people and the language. Um, and so if you ask me what the tenets of African spirituality are, I'd probably say something about ritual. I'd probably say something about family. I'd say something about rites of passages at birth. I'd say something about mysticism. I'd say something about nature. Um, and kind of the, the underlying tone to all of that is this idea of ancestors and this idea of the living dead, that people transition but do not die in a sense. So at any given moment, I can still access my ancestors through incantations or through ritual. Um, and so we, there's a sense of there's a thin veil between the living and the dead um, and that the dead are not actually dead um, and that they can access us equally and we can access them through dreams, through visitations, and through nature. And so what does this look like in a pandemic? Um, of course, as the other two speakers have so eloquently put forward, is that there's been a disruption. There's been a disruption of gatherings and rituals. There's been a disruption of family. And things have either been suspended or altered. Um, the huge thing, and I guess this is part of why it was so touching for me to, to be part of the, um, well, to see this kind of conversation coming up in the Good Society is one of the things we've had to battle with, if, if the most important tenant um, in uh, spirituality is the transition between the living and the dead, then that moment of death, which Laura also speaks to, those rituals that you have to do when somebody dies, becomes very important. And so that transition has been disrupted. So people are not able to bury their dead in the ways that they have been used to before. And equally, people are not able to grieve in the same ways. Um, and so, but also on the other hand, because it's not an organized religion, it doesn't have a building, it relies on family and it relies on, on relationships, then of course, um, there's some freedom, even while the presence of death um, is, has, has really altered the ways in which we think about this. And so the lockdown has really meant um, th rethinking what the narrative is about this, the earth locking down. What does it mean when mother nature, in a sense, has asked us to stop and has asked us to retreat from our everyday? And so questions of rebirth and at a more mystic level um, become 
very prominent and what does it mean when we are asked to pause and so i'll pause there as well thank you atom bile that was beautiful our final speaker is dr tim bull who's director of ministry for the church of england diocese of st albans where he's responsible for strategy and delivery in the areas of recruitment training well-being and review for 300 clergy in 400 churches across Bedfordshire and Hertfordshire. Tim is a priest and canon at St Albans Cathedral, where he executes pastoral duties and is a member of the Church of England's General Synod. And if Laura's three postgraduate degrees weren't enough, Tim holds two doctorates, one in computer science and the other in theology and genetics. Tim. Thank you very much for joining us. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. And this is the first of my these uh, meetings, so it's really a real privilege to be taking part. I'm going to uh, share my screen with you, so hopefully you can still see me popping up in the, the corner. But there are three things that I want to uh, share with you this evening, three um, brief uh, thoughts to, um, to get us thinking. Uh, the first is this, that uh, we're familiar with the idea of an act of God clause in our um, insurance policy. We know about an act of God being something like an earthquake or a tsunami or a flood. But the question about this pandemic is, is it literally an act of God? Is this pandemic through which we're living uh, literally caused by God, maybe for some particular purpose? Maybe God has sent the pandemic in order to uh, help us look after creation by uh, reducing the number of flights that we're making. Maybe God has sent the pandemic in order to um, discipline us for some particular failing or evil uh, we've committed. And many people would say, actually, um, yes, that is why God has sent the pandemic. Uh, but I tend to uh, disagree, and I do so on a, a couple of reasons. Uh, first of all, if God has sent this pandemic in order to say something to us, um, God is not doing a very good job at communicating. It's not entirely, not uh, at all clear what it is we're supposed to be uh, learning from this. So I don't think on that grounds that God has sent the pandemic. The next reason why I don't think God has sent the pandemic is the story from uh, the Bible of a chap called Agabus. Agabus. Agabus uh, lived a few years after the time of uh, Jesus and on one occasion we read in our Christian scriptures that Agabus saw that a uh, famine was coming and the Christians at that time didn't all sit down and say to themselves now hang on a minute what's God saying to us through this famine what what must we have done to cause God to send this disaster uh, no they didn't do that at all rather they decided to help those people uh, in need I think the pandemic is much more an opportunity uh, to help those who are in need in our society and our world to create a better society. So is a pandemic an act of God? Uh, I would say personally, I don't think it is. So why should uh, Christians respond to the pandemic um, in particularly sort of altruistic and caring ways? Well, if we read through our Christian scriptures, we discover right at the beginning the story of creation. And in the story of creation, God makes the world. And we read that God looks at all that he has made and it was good. It was very good. Now, the word that we translate as good is the Hebrew word tov. And tov means um, good in a particular way. It means everything is um, just as it should be. Everything is kind of running smoothly like a well-oiled machine. Um, everything is like Goldilocks's porridge. It's, um, it's just right. Uh, creation is uh, rich and fruitful and abundant and human beings live in harmony with one another and with God and with creation. But of course things don't stay like that. As a result of human um, selfishness, uh, human stupidity, uh, we live in a world that's damaged and divided and broken. We see things like the pandemic, we see uh, global warming, we see um, racism and intolerance, we see uh, violence, and we see all kinds of things that are wrong with our world. But the Christian story continues with uh, the appearance of the figure of Jesus. And we read in our scriptures of how Jesus put right everything in the world that's wrong. 
So on blind eyes were restored to sight, uh, the lame were able to walk again. Uh, when the wedding ran out of wine, Jesus turned the water into wine, ensuring that everybody had enough to drink. Jesus was in the business of making the world the kind of place that God wanted it uh, to be. And now, as Christians uh, and those who endeavour to follow Jesus Christ, we likewise are called to follow in his footsteps, making the world the place that God wants it to be. The church often has had a bad press in the past, but it's been at its best, I believe, when it's been involved in that work, uh, founding schools and hospitals and hospices, uh, more recently setting up food banks. When our churches are um, closed in this diocese, uh, the Christian ministers were among those who thought to ensure that people in their communities were cared for. So the second point, we endeavour to make the world the place that God intended it to be. Uh, and then finally, since spirituality was in the title of this evening, what about spirituality? Well, Christianity was born into a pagan world, the world of uh, the Roman and Greeks gods and goddesses uh, with all their temples and rituals and sacrifices and all the, uh, the stuff that you had to do if you were a follower of one of those religions. But Christianity was different because uh, Christianity um, didn't um, involve religious ritual. That wasn't the core element of the faith. Rather, first of all, it was about the things we believed. It was holding on to certain um, tenets of faith. Uh, Christianity was the first religion in which the idea of heresy uh, was a thing, where you could believe the wrong thing. But more importantly, uh, Christianity was a faith about personal connectedness with God. We no longer needed intermediaries, uh, temples, sacrifices, priests, in order to connect with God. Each one of us taught on Christianity, could connect with God just as we were in whatever position and situation we found ourselves. Of course, certain ceremonies and rituals have built up over the uh, ages, but uh, fundamentally it's about a personal connectedness with God. So when uh, COVID-19 came along um, and churches uh, closed down, we were able to rediscover the opportunity uh, to connect with God, not through buildings, not through meeting together and services, uh, not through particular Christian ceremonies, but to discover God uh, in each and every place that we were, uh, in the garden, uh, in the community, in our, in our homes. Of course, the question then for uh, clergy and those of us who church leaders is, well, that all sounds great, uh, but does that mean that there is a danger that when uh, the COVID-19 pandemic is over and our churches reopen, uh, folks are not so uh, keen to return and to connect with God again. Th so there we are, my three points. First of all, um, don't say that this pandemic is something that which God has caused. Um, it's not. Secondly, uh, work together to make the world the place that God intends it to be. And thirdly, uh, take this opportunity to discover a connectedness with God outside the sphere of organised religion. There we are. That's it. Tim, thank you so much. I've been having some um, internet trouble on my end, so I'm just glad I was able to get back in time. I can see that there have been loads of questions. Um, so I am going to ask uh, the Good Society Forum team to invite back our speakers um, onto uh, uh, the proverbial stage, if you will, so we can have a bit of a Q&A uh, right now. Um, so hopefully um, the team can, there we go, fantastic. Abdurrahman, thank you so much for your interventions. Atambile, Laura, thank you so much. So we've, we've had um, lots of um, chats uh, on, on the chat function. It's obviously a huge topic. Um, and you've all come at it incredibly um, beautifully, eloquently, and from some from such different contexts. So, I guess the 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 first question I almost wanna wanna ask from from my perspective, and something just to start the conversation off on, is during this time of huge uncertainty, um, where people are seeking um, answers, they're seeking some form of a, a response and an, an understanding, a prism. To what's going on 
in in your context, how has that been met? And I and I, I'm going to go straight in with this question. Um, with the, I, I guess there's also a, a tension between organized religion um, and and some individuals who may feel it's inaccessible to them. And I'm I'm, I'm thinking less about those who are part of say congregations already, and those who may be in in um, not in congregations and may not be practicing day to day in synagogues, in the church, in the mosque and who are now feeling a sense of, oh my God, where do I go? Have you in your daily lives ex experienced those uh, individuals who perhaps are not part of any uh, organized practice of faith, but because of the pandemic have, have, have been um, encouraged to, uh, to explore? And, and, and what has that looked like? Because I've been talking to a lot of my friends who perhaps have more difficult and fraught relationships with God than I may have personally, and they've been asking the same questions I have. I've always had a reference point and they've been exploring in really interesting ways. Um, Abdul Rahman, do you mind if I come to you first with that question? Uh, of course, Niz, and, and it's such a fascinating question. And, and I think we, those of us um, from the Muslim tradition have just been through probably uh, the most unusual Ramadan of our lives. You know, for 30 days of, of, of fasting from dawn to dusk, uh, issuing food, drink, and intimacy during the daylight hours. For us, as, as you know, and as our friends on this call know, Ramadan is a social time, um, is a time of, of, of community, is a time where the nights are long, not only with prayer and, and ritual, but with, with fellowship and companionship and, and sharing. And, and all of a sudden you're at home. Uh, in some cases you're on your own. In other cases you're with family. In some cases you have the privilege of not having to go to work. In other cases you have to put on your mask and take risks because that's the situation that you're in. And what I found happening during that particular period, and I think there's, there's some scholars who are beginning to look at this through ethnographic research, is to kind of understand, well, what are the processes by which community and meaning is being created. I've talked to a number of people. I had a, we had a friend over from New York the other night and she said, I hardly fast in Ramadan. It hasn't been part of my spiritual life, but this Ramadan and pandemic, I felt like I had to fast. I needed some connection to something that was larger than me, a tradition that was larger than me. All of a sudden there was this kind of need to engage not only with sacred texts, but particularly within the Muslim tradition with Sufi circles, circles of spirituality, circles where the litanies and the divine names were being chanted and, and, and sung. And I think there is this sense that in this particular moment, there is a desire to find meaning. And whether that's a desire to find God, I think there's many ways to answer that. But what uh, Atambile, what you said really resonated with me. And thank you for, for your beautiful intervention. I, I, I just, uh, I, I wish those six minutes were, were like in slow-mo so we could, I want to hear more. But, but I loved um, the way you described uh, the African spiritual traditions about the veil between the living and the dead. And, and I feel like coming from within an Islamic tradition that, um, that, 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 that has Sufism and mysticism at the very heart of it, that idea of thin spaces and that veil, Celtic Christianity has the ideal of the thin spaces. I believe that we are actually like kind of in a global thin space. And that, and that the, we, 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 I have never lived a time in my life, and, and this speaks to my own privilege, that death has been so close. Death has looked around every corner. I don't know one friend in the United Kingdom, for example, who hasn't known someone who has died during this pandemic, that we ourselves have been affected by it. Rabbi Laura has spoken about it. Um, you know, death is really close and it has never felt closer. And I think that that awareness of death forces us into that bigger conversation about the big meaning of things. And, and, that, and, and that is also a political moment as well, because mm -hmm. you realize then the reality is life is short. We're always living in 11th hour. So what are we going to do with the time that we have and the I'm moment that we're given? Th thank you so much. And I want to quickly go to Atam Bile and, and specifically, because I know you talked to me about um, the podcast that you've done and how it was 
revisited by many people on African spirituality because people have been yearning. So, so in resp- maybe in response to what Abdul Rahman has just said and the question around um, people's yearning for deeper meaning in this time of crisis and uncertainty, what does that look like for the work that you do in the world that you're in? Yeah, um, I mean, uh, that's something that I, I realized that I, I didn't quite get to. Um, one of the things that I noticed was um, getting a lot of emails and messages, even from people I didn't know about when season two coming up, because what we did with the podcast, we only had season one. And all of a sudden, people were either revisiting all the episodes and wanting more conversations. Um, and that was really striking for us, because while we had received quite a lot of um, feedback from when we were doing the first season, Obviously, we didn't <laughs> anticipate that a global pandemic would happen, but it was quite a relief for us to see that people were using that as a space of solace and they were looking for something and that it was able to answer some questions for them. Um, and I think it then kind of put us in conversation with a virtual com- community because what people have been able to do, I mean, other than the gatherings on Zoom, I mean, I've attended a memorial service on Zoom. Um, I was part of a an incantation of sorts on Sunday, also over Zoom, is that now there's an understanding or an appreciation of what the virtual world can do for us to be able to connect. Of course, it's not the same as, as especially Laura spoke about a bit about that in the same way because it's not tactile, it's not the music. And one of the things that my friends and I have been doing was just sharing um, sound clips of the, the church music, which is quite distinct. So it's African Christianity because that's a whole other conversation, but the drums and the bells and just swapping that around. WhatsApp has been a huge place of solace as well because people are able to swap voice notes of either a prayer or a, a, um, a kind of a reading of sorts. And so we really, uh, I mean, in our case, we leaned into what was available and the, the podcast was really a place for, for those big questions as Abdurrahim uh, was speaking to. Asambile, thank you. And, and, and Rabbi Laura, if I can come to you next, and, and, and Julie has asked a question which Abdurrahman has um, uh, kind of refer to around what will this look like for us moving forward? And, and Atambile has just talked about the digital space. And Julie's question is, how will the pandemic affect our religious spiritual practices once it's safe to gather again? Example, five years from now, are we going to see some of this uh, adaptive behavior, some of this innovations that have made it more accessible? Um, are we going to see that more permanently? Is that something that you're seeing in your world? Oh, yes. I think uh, some of the good stuff is going to stay. Um, uh, Atul Rahman Malik talked about uh, changes of power and people uh, being empowered by this. And I think that that is going to stay. Um, I think both from the point of view of people who were not happy with tech before. I also think that whereas before we had services and gatherings which were only in person and that now are online, the people who would be excluded uh, by not being able to also have online, we will have also online because else by definition, how on earth can you call yourself welcoming and inclusive if you're saying, except actually, of course, those people who are disabled, those people who are in hospital, those people who can't make it, don't worry about you. And you just put a light on what we did before, which wasn't good enough, actually. Um, so I think we will continue both virtually um, and in person. Um, and that will change. So if there's a change in power and the, and the people who've come in the door, virtual door, are like, hmm, that's not too bad. I quite like that. So I think that will also change. Thank you. And, and Tim, I mean, you, you had your first online sermon um, over the last few weeks and, and months. I'd love to hear from you how, how that went for you as somebody who's used to the glorious physical building of St. Albans Cathedral. Um, And Kao Sahir has has made a a, a really good point around online community of faith and actually probably feeling more welcoming um, uh, in in terms of online spaces. In terms of outreach for you, how has that worked? The answer to the first part of your question about the sermon, um, that's much harder. It's much harder to engage with the camera than it is to engage with people in front of you. So Personally, I found that quite hard. I think the, in terms of people engaging with, with worship, what has happened is when people engage online at home, sitting in front of their laptop or their TV, they can do so with kind of a, a cup of coffee, a biscuit, they can have a newspaper beside them. It's blurred very much the di- dividing line between doing something religious 
and doing something secular, if I can make that division, which of course has advantages and disadvantages. It has the advantage that it's much easier for our, all of us to kind of engage in religion, whether we regard ourselves as kind of religious or not. The disadvantage is it reduces that level of commitment that for some people is a thing that kind of keeps them going and, and makes it a significant element of their lives. So I, I think it will, ch it will certainly change. Whether it will change for good or ill, I think the jury is still out on that. Thank you, Tim. And, and, and Kaus's point was so good, I'm going to revisit it, which was talking about how, you know, there's, in, in terms of going online, there's less of a sense of judgment. Um, it feels less geographically closed. It really opens it up. And so there is a question mark around, so there is technology to be utilized. And historically, some of the limitations of practice, maybe in terms of organized practice, has been a, a sense of physical um, distance. But so here's a practical question How do we, if spirituality, if people are yearning for meaning and yearning for spirituality, um, and historically one of the blockages has been maybe physical um, distance, now that it's opened up, how do you connect those two worlds of opportunity versus people's conditions from before, feeling that they had obstacles? Very interesting on the internet. There are there are two basic models. You've got your uh, kind of Amazon model, your Google model, where you have everything centralized in one place, and one place does the thing really well. And then you have the social media Twitter model, where each of us becomes producers uh, in our own right. And so far, I've observed church going much more down the kind of the Twitter social media model rather than the Amazon Google model. It's not but one or two churches kind of grab everybody um, as their worshippers, which could easily have happened. People still want that sense of kind of local connection, that um, involvement with a particular community in a particular place. That's so interesting, Tim. Um, Atembile, I saw you nodding your head earlier, just wondering if you had something to, to contribute to this particular um, part of the discussion. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I kind of talk about... Uh, while I mentioned that people are using the virtual communities, I, I think I must say that I'm talking about a particular community of people who are privileged. In my context, the majority of people don't have this. Mm. Um, and I think it's important to say that. So I also think that there are people who just cannot wait to be able to go back to church, to be able to gather. In, there's a gathering of healers called Inkombe. They can't wait to have Inkombe again. They can't wait to be a, amongst people. And I guess that the kind of the heaving bodies and the singing in particular, people can't wait for that because you cannot simulate that virtually. Um, and so I think it is important for me to be able to say that I am, when I talk about virtual communities, I'm talking about a particular class of people um, but I think on the one hand, I think we're going to see a new wave of expression. Um, I've seen a lot of young people while their questions and they're bringing them to social media um, because for a long time for us, African spirituality has kind of been hovered in secrecy and not knowing. And so that curiosity and that seeking for meaning, I hope is going to translate into different and perhaps, perhaps more hybrid communities after the pandemic. Thank you. And, and Abdurrahman, I want to come to you with a, a, a beautifully structured question. Jorge has almost gone inside me and, and can't come up with this, which is talking about co-living with spirituality and day-to-day and -day life being separated um, in terms of the pandemic. So even if we have realized we are dependent on each other, that communal bit that you talked about, and today we've seen these glorious images coming out of Hajj, where people are doing socially distanced tawaf, um, and, and how we can't be with each other, and yet we must, we must survive as individuals in the short term. So here we are craving community. How do we combine those very opposite ways of feeling? Well, I think, I think that is the, in, in a way, and, and as practitioners of, of faith and spirituality on this, uh, on this call, my fellow panelists, we know that that's always at the heart of the, of the I wouldn't even say tension. It is the, it is the energy. Uh, that comes from the communal experience made personal, the personal made communal, the longing, as Athambile so poetically said, of, of the heaving bodies and the presence and the feeling, um, but at the same time drawing back and, and seeing what that's doing to us. Uh, for me, it's, it's part of it is, is around and, and, and f through my Islamic tradition is to see how do I take this, the emblematic virtue or ethic in Islam, which is rahma or mercy, uh, compassion. How do I take that 
and, and make that a part of my life and then, ex uh, then create it within community, then establish it in the world with everyone and anyone because as humans we're connected through that, that, that thread of divine mercy. And that's why in a way, Tim, when, when, when you spoke about the, the role of God in all of this, um, I, I, think, I think in some ways the Muslim tradition would say, no, God is very much part of this. That part of the, that God is very much present, that this pandemic, this moment is part of creation. The pandemic is part of God's creation. And that theologically we understand that, that we are not talking about theodicy in that, in that kind of stale sense. What we're talking about is that we live in a divinely created dynamic world where harm and risk and danger exist alongside love and beauty and mercy and compassion. And that the oppression that humans cause, that we have reason to unite when circumstances are given to us that, that, that force us to, to come to terms with our own humanity and to protect one another. So what I would say, Nizam, in the final equation for me is that what this moment has done in many ways, and, 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 and to underscore again the privilege of those who are able to do it, what I'm seeing in our communities is that those who have felt marginalized, people from, from sexual minorities, uh, women, other marginalized communities within Muslim communities have found, have found spaces, and those spaces have become ever more robust. And in fact, in the aftermath of George Floyd, it's been so interesting how all of a sudden the wider Muslim community in the places where I live and interact have all of a sudden rediscovered or discovered the fact that there are vibrant black Muslim expressions. They didn't need the pandemic, but the, what the pandemic moment has caused is that it's forced us to almost search outside of our institutions, online and other spaces. And so, in fact, what I'm seeing is a thousand flowers blooming of all kinds of expressions of all kinds of ways of being spiritual in the world and actually of all kinds of questioning happening. And the kind of questioning that I think people would have been afraid to do a few months back, some people would have been afraid to do, they're now doing it pretty openly. And I think that's good. I think that's good and for faith. On that, and, 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 and Rabbi Laura, I want to go, come to you next. Um, just really conscious of time. One hour is never enough for any of our topics, I know that. Um, but Abdurrahman, what you have just said, there's a, there's a, a comment here which I think you've just absolutely um, hit the nail on the head in terms of we are in the process of confusing formal religious tradition and experience of religion. All humans have religious beliefs only if you identify with formal religious traditions. I don't think we need to be so uh, uh, disciplined and structured with how we understand religion and, and faith. And I think what you've just described beautifully is a good response to that. Rabbi Laura, there is a question from my friend Andrea who will, who will get upset with me if I don't ask you. It, it, she's from Las Vegas and she's talked about um, many elderly friends um, in their last days um, uh, who've not been able to, who've not been uh, able to be with their parents, um, including her own mother, um, and and she talked about specifically, and I think this is a specific question which we can address, which is why are we not being offered hazmat suits so we can be near them um, in the context of, of faith? And and she said her Jewish friends in particular are suffering, and I felt I had to ask, ask the question um, if you want to quickly answer that, and then we can go around. Well, because hospitals were much more concerned about stopping death and they very wisely prioritized the person who saving life over everything else as they should they, that's completely right i just interviewed for my podcast the um, uh, chief operating officer of the royal free hospital in london and she said we were learning we were flying an airplane whilst learning how to fly you and know, on that and 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 I mean, I think you've, you've, you've beautifully uh, answered that question. So we're, com we're coming to the end and we've got even more great questions coming. Um, and we want to end on, and I'm going to go around, so please feel free to summarize if there's anything that you feel that you have been able to say. Please wrap it up in this, in this final point, which is what has given you the greatest hope during this pandemic in relation to spirituality? It could be personal insights and reflections. It could be congregational. It could be societal. It could be country level. What for you has given you hope that, uh, especially that you've seen and observed, because usually our, our wonderful community is a community of practitioners. So the more practical, the better. And something, something, you know, when we say spiritual, it feels quite disconnected. And I'd love to bring it back a little bit more in terms of how we can practically connect to our spirituality. And I know 
it's a it's a it's a difficult question. So Tim, I want to go with you because I, I know you've had a few things that you've wanted to say and and, and forgive me for yeah, not being able to come to you. Thank you. Um, one thing uh, that we we did locally was we set up a, a twenty four seven helpline so that people who had uh, lost loved ones through COVID nineteen or who were gravely ill uh, could phone that, and we had a team of phone operators who would put them in contact with. Uh, someone from any faith and not just Christianity um, who would offer pastoral and spiritual support and it's those kind of practical demonstrations of uh, God's love that I think inspire me most. Thank you so much Tim that was beautiful. Rabbi Laura. Uh, when you're a clergy person sometimes you feel very lonely you feel like you're in a gig and no one else is coming the mind body connection the need for spirituality the need for ritual the need for other people the need to sing the need to meditate this is no not marginal in any way and we've seen that beautiful thank you so much atom billy i think i'm going to end on a personal reflection so i i live in johannesburg which is right in the middle of the country and when lockdown happened for us i evacuated and came to the coast which means i live on the doorstep of the beach and what i left behind in johannesburg was an altar so i usually have an altar even though i go to church every other while but i have an altar in my space and when I left my altar behind, I realized how much I missed it. But the beauty was that I had the expansiveness of the ocean. So what I was able to do at my altar, I'm now able to do it in the ocean. And I guess it's that reflection on the, the, the importance of nature, the importance of being outside, is that it's not the same as I can't replace the community that I've lost in the process of lockdown, but I've at least been able to relate to nature in different ways. So the prayers that I say at my altar and other prayers that I say in the sea, and somehow they still lifted. So that is what has been giving me hope. It's beautiful. Thank you, Hatim Bile. And last but by no means least, the beard, aka Abdurrahman Malik. Um, it, two quick thoughts. One has been uh, that this turning inward and being at home and, and being with Farina and, and, and our son Abdi has meant that, you know, uh, uh, it's, been, it's been a moment for us in our busy lives to rekindle love and compassion and mercy and flexibility in, in the home. And, 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 to, and to, for those of us who work so much outside of our houses and travel, this being at home has been, has been, has been really, um, has been really a, a blessing in, in some ways and has re-taught re us how to, how to be together. And the other thing I'm seeing is that as particularly in the aftermath of, 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 of the anti-Black racism uprisings, I see incredible energy amongst the young people we work with here at Yale and elsewhere to, to really heal, repair, and bring justice back into the world. They're flocking to the online seminars. They want to get trained. They want to do something. They're sitting in their homes and they're realizing, God, we have energy. We have agency. We need to, and, and that has been so heartening. And this desire to learn, this desire to re-engage and, and read and to get yourself up to, up to snuff so you can be that agent of change. Uh, with so many of our students and young people, that's been, that's been so exciting and, and, and so promising. Abdul Rahman, Rabbi Laura, Atambile, Tim, thank you so much for your time. Um, we have greatly appreciated it. It's been a really enriching conversation. We're never going to be able to address God and the good society or spirituality in an hour. We know that. So let me apologize to um, some of our, our, our attendees who've asked questions we haven't had the time to address. Ibrahim in particular, um, we, we thank you for joining us. Um, but um, we hope to revisit these topics in, in future webinars. Um, and so the conversation hasn't ended, it's just begun. Um, so thank you very much for everything. Emma. I just want to echo Niz's thanks to Tim Abdurrahman, Atambile and Laura. This was our 20th webinar. And it's been an amazing experience for us during this time of COVID to actually build community in this way. So I want to say a special thanks to Nizam for his amazing moderation. He's really helped build that community. To Tiffany, Juan Carlos and Tim who are behind the screens who've really helped put everything together. So thank you to you all. We are going on holiday, but we'll be back in September and we look forward to reconnecting with everyone then so and thank by God, 
and, and Emma, by going on holiday, we're going to reconsolidate, review, renew. And actually, if you have ideas, we're going to spend the next month really reviewing how we move forward with this community that we've built with these webinars. If you have ideas, all the more reason to get in touch with us because you're going to miss our faces for the next month. So thank you so much, everybody. Um, and we will see you in September. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.